بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم از بلای نخشک همی رجیم I first met uh, Sheikh Fadlallah some years ago uh, when he asked me to come, Natalia and I, to come to South Africa. And, and he asked me to come there to talk about the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. <laughs> um, and um, it was, um, you could say, love at first sight. <laughs> or if you believe in other lives after many sights. What I wanted to share with you this afternoon was a little bit about this, uh, and being that that we're that we're Muslims, to share it from from this point of view. Uh, as my life has unusually turned out, uh, uh, certainly against my conscious will, I've ended up spending a lot of my time explaining this to Christians over the last almost 30 years, I would say. And, uh, and some of it is even just a matter of telling Christians something as simple as Jesus used a similar word for God that Muslims use. Or telling people, Christians in Europe or in the United States, if, if a Christian is an Arabic speaker, and you go to a liturgy or a Roman Catholic mass that's celebrated in the Arabic language, don't be surprised if you hear the word Allah. <laughs> so if you can believe that this is news to many people in the world today, um, this tells you the type, you could say that, you know, the type of work we have ahead of us, really, type of challenge. I find it very interesting, actually. Uh, when I tell, this will be obvious to all of you. Uh, if you've been to a Maronite Mass, for instance, in Lebanon, and they're chanting during the month of May hymns to Mary, Jesus' mother, uh, you will hear every night around the time of uh, Maghreb, uh, during, if May, during the month of May, hour, you know, an hour long of, of simply uh, the words of the angel to to Mary in Arabic, and then, you know, blessed are you amongst all people, you know, blesses the fruit of your womb, Jesus, and, and then, all, you know, all, and all of this in Arabic, and uh, it's beautiful, it's incredible. I've, you know, I've, I've been there during the month of May, not Er Lebanon, but I've been in to a, Lebe, uh, a Maronite Mass in Israel during this time. You know, the, the, as Sheikh Fadlala was saying, the good thing about living in the world today is that people in many traditions uh, who may have been raised in certain traditions, they're looking for some sense of, of reality, something for their everyday life in these traditions. They don't, they don't want to, uh, <clears throat> again using uh, Sheikh Na's words, simply hang about on the ladder. They want to use the ladder to get somewhere, to climb somewhere. So rather than, say, having a ladder and then gold plating it and putting it on an altar somewhere, they're thinking, well, what is all this for? What does it mean for my life? This is why we find churches being abandoned uh, all over the world today. Uh, you could say that they're a little further along in this process, uh, this process that all human beings are prone to, where, as I mentioned the other day, we confuse things. We confuse, um, we confuse medicine for poison or poison for medicine. We confuse a ladder for, you could say, some sacred object rather than uh, something that wants to help us get somewhere. Uh, we gold plate the path rather than travel it. Or we say, you know, look, here's this wonderful path. <laughs> you know, don't you, don't, you want, don't, don't you really agree that this is the, absolutely the best path ever? You know, and we make it nicer and nicer, but we never walk on it. 
So it's the same. Humans are the same everywhere. So alhamdulillah, it's wonderful. Um, I was speaking to uh, Sheikh Muslim just during the break, and he says that he and uh, Abdul Salam, you know, they bring school children from Stockholm into the mosque and say, look, here's a mosque, and, you know, it's, you know this is what it's really all about. You know, this is, it's about hearts. It's about hearts opening. It's about being in surrender to Allah. You know, it's not about all the things you've heard about. This is an incredible service. You know, this benefits not only school children in Stockholm, it, it, it benefits everyone in Stockholm, everyone in Sweden, uh, maybe everyone in the world is benefited by the ripples that go out from this type of very, very simple work. So you, we never know who are the people that we touch and who are the people that they touch and who are the people that they touch, and we don't need to know. It's the best thing is never to take credit. <laughs> so the most awkward thing is having to be a person sitting here <laughs> And a person who's written books, and then people ask you, well, you know, you wrote this book 10 years ago, and you say there, and I say, well, yeah, I wrote that 10 years ago, but, you know, now I would tell you this. <laughs> Just once you start to write things down, then people think, oh, if this is a book, so it means something. Well, yeah, maybe it means something. But, you know, a book is an invitation to have an experience. I mean, that's the, that, that's the way I feel. Or they should at least be entertaining. <laughs> so I've tried to do both, and some of my work, but, you know, again, the good thing about Christianity is I would say there are three major movements in Western Christianity to take, you could say, the Jesus tradition in a more contemplative fashion, in a more prayerful fashion, where it becomes something about what you experience rather than what you believe. Um, there's a tradition called contemplative prayer, which draws primarily, um, I would have to say, from Far Eastern traditions, yogic traditions, mantric traditions. Essentially, they're breathing, they're doing a form of fiqh, but they're using some sort of English word or European word, which is translated from the Bible. There's another style, which is called centering prayer, which uses body awareness, the awareness of our bodies, you're centering also your breathing, some, you know, a good intention with good niya, we would say, good intention, good affirmation. Uh, again, it's about having an experience and coming to a place where people start to experience, let's say, what, what the prophet experienced, or at least using the prophet as a doorway for having their own experience. Uh, and then the third, I would say, the, you said the gradually growing, I would say, is, is where people are intoning or meditating with words of Jesus in his native language uh, in a similar way that we do. They chant a bit, and then they do some fic, and then they release the word and just, you know, are in the wordless prayer. And this, is, this has gradually grown a bit over the last 30 years. So there are people who do do this in churches, around churches, in people's homes, this sort of, this sort of thing. The major problem, I will tell you, with Western Christianity is due to a simple error of translation. It's simple, but it, you could say it was partially intentional. Um, but we won't blame anyone because blaming is sort of worthless. It's about what happened in the past. And it's a simple category, we say philosophically a category error, where Jesus says several times in his native language, if you have the same trust that I have, you will find out how your life makes sense. If you have the same faith or trust, and he uses a word that is identical, virtually identical, with the word iman. In Aramaic, the word is hai manuta, hai manuta. So really it's two, it's al hai with iman together, hai manuta in Aramaic. He says, if you have this energized trust that Allah is the whole of reality, then your life will make sense. You will find out why you're here, what you're doing here, why you're doing what you're doing, 
um, and and what you're here for, what, basically what you're here for. Or in another place, he says, if you have this same sort of energized trust that I have, that Allah is all, and you know, and and I have nothing to do with it, he makes this clear in the Gospel of John, then you will do the same things that I have done and greater than these things. And that's an accurate translation. Now, Christians translated the first of these in Western Christianity, and some of this is a translation error, that when it came out of the, the Middle Eastern language into the Western, the Greek, it's got a little bit infected, like a computer virus, with, pl with Platonic philosophy. And I won't go into that right now, but I'll say a bit more about it later. So this first phrase, if you have this energized trust in Allah, Allah, Allah is the name Jesus used for God, as you may have gathered. Sounds similar, doesn't it? It is. If you have this energized trust, you will, you will have energy, you will receive energy, you will find that you are life energy. Hai manuta. And your life will make sense. So they translated this as, um, believe in me and you will be saved. Believe in me rather than believe like me. In or like, in or like, believe as I believe or believe in me. That's a prepositional error, linguistically speaking. It's a big one. I sometimes say, all of this hinges on small things, I say to Christians. You know, you're you got your prepositions wrong. <laughs> you think it's like minor thing. It's a big thing. And then, and you, this will, and it will make sense of your life. So the word here that's used is a form of the word um, uh, shua in Aramaic. Uh, you will, sometimes it's translated as you will be redeemed. But to redeem in the Semitic languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, it means that which makes sense of your life, that which makes living worthwhile. How do you redeem something? Well, let's say, you know, you've got a coupon in your lo local store. They send it to you on the internet because you've been a good customer, as Sheikh Falala says. You've been this great customer, so we're sending you this special offer. You bring this coupon, you print it out, you bring this coupon into the store, and we will redeem this for... Uh, 200 kroners off your next purchase. Okay, so the redeeming is the making good, you could say. It makes sense of it. You know, I, I, exp I exchange this little piece of paper for a discount on this thing. The paper is, you know, is not, is only symbolical of, of what its purpose is. The purpose is to give me a discount. So what redeems is that which makes sense, which you could say, which which brings it into a bigger picture, which, how would we say, makes good, makes something good, makes something ripe, makes, some, makes sense of something. And um, again, it's the height of, our, our, you could say, irony in some ways, that Jesus' name means, well, you know, Jesus, what do you have in, in Swedish? Jesus. Jesus, which is similar to the Greek, Jesus, uh, Jesus is a transliteration of Aramaic, Yahshua. Yahshua. Yah is that particle in Hebrew Aramaic that indicates yeah, life, life energy, the ever living life. It becomes part of the so called unnameable name or unpronounceable name in the Hebrew language. You may have heard of this, the name that you're never supposed to say. Um, it became this thing, you know, it's in Indiana Jones and all these films, and if you say the name, then you, you know, whatever, the demons, you know, whatever. But, you know, a lot of this is superstition. Um, the unnameable name is most, was most likely unnameable because it was unpronounceable. And the reason it's unpronounceable is, it, is because it's four consonants with no vowels, and there were no pointings, no like in Arabic. So four consonants, but with no vowels. Each of those consonants are living letters that indicate some aspect of life, energy, big life, life as the whole universe is this one life. And this one life 
again, because Hebrew has no definite past, present, and past, present or future, this life which has an existence beyond and above and beneath time, no past, present, future. So in ancient Hebrew, you can do this, uh, where all the tenses, past, present, and future, are mixed up in one word. And you could say you have past, present, future in, in one, which means there's no time. So this life, which is beyond time, is found in a sound that's something like this. which is the sound of our own breath. So the most sacred name is then the sound of our own breath that connects us to this larger life, this larger breath. So that means it's not pronounceable as a word, as a human word. It's felt as a breath. Okay, does any make that make sense to you? That's sort of how, you know, and so then it'd be all this mythology grew up around it and, okay, only the priests are supposed to say this in the Holy of Holies and a particular, and, and, and on, and on. But, you know, that's human tendency. You know, we, we make up, you know, stories around things and sometimes it's good to keep certain things sacred and most sacred. But what is the most sacred? What were our ancestors trying to remind us? The most sacred thing is the sound of our own breath and how we connect to this this source which is all, which is everything, which is beyond time and space, and which is breathing us rather than we're doing anything, again to echo uh, Muna. So with that as the preamble, uh, you know, but many Christians, I would, I would tell you today, many Western Christians understand all this intuitively already. They don't need Aramaic. I've been doing this for over 30 years, and I, people come to me after my talks or after I do the, whatever I'm doing, and they say, you know, I always knew in my heart this was true, and you've just sort of given me a justification for it, which I suppose is helpful. It's a confirmation for people. Um, you know, basically that. Here's Jesus' prayer. So listen, close your eyes for a moment, or, or allow your eyes to be open, doesn't matter, and just listen to the sounds for a moment. Abun de Bashmaya, Lutka de Shamoch, Adete Malkutach, Nechwe Sibion of Icon de Bashmaya of Baar Ah, Hoblon Lachama de Sunconan Yaomana, Washbuklan Haubain Wachtahain, I cannot of Hanan Schwachanel Hayabain, Wela Tahalan Linasuna, Ela Patsan Min Bisha. Metul de la Haimal Kuta, Wahaila Wateshbuchta, Lalam Almin Amen. Lalam Almin Amen. Now, as uh, Sheikh Muslim was saying, his intuition is that this is in some ways very similar to the Fatiha. And I told him, You're exactly right. <laughs> um, the Semitic, the sacred ancient Semitic tradition is full of short prayers which begin and end somewhat similarly, actually. And I'll show you how that works with Jesus' prayer. And then we'll, we'll, we'll take some time halfway through the prayer to just chant what might have been Jesus' sort of main wazifas, his main asmal husna that he was using. You'll recognize them all. You know them all, uh, actually, up to the first half of the prayer. And then the second half is something else again, but also some similarities. Jesus begins his prayer like this. Remember I said with Samawati al-Ad? Shemaya is Samawati. Same root. Shem becomes Sam in Arabic. Shem from the ancient Hebrew. Name or light or sound. Limitless, boundaryless. What's the key word here is awun, awun, which is usually translated what? Okay. Uh, exactly, thank you. <laughs> Our Father. Awun, awun. Abba would be father in Aramaic or Hebrew. 
We still have it today. It's still used almost universally, or in many cultures, as the name for the, the personal father. Ah, wun has this lovely wun ending, ah, wun, which means it's not just my father or our, it's like our, the big our, <laughs> the father of all beings, our. Now, why did, let's say, there is a word which is similar to rab in Aramaic. Um, Jesus sometimes uses it, but he did not use it here. In fact, ab, the ab of abun, is found in the rabia of the Aramaic, ra-ab. Again, <laughs> linguistic footnote here for Muna. The ancient Semitic languages, uh, Hebrew Aramaic, have two letter roots, and if you rather than three. When Arabic grammar was put together, and this is after the time of Muhammad, they imagined the grammar as three letter roots. But ultimately, how many roots is the basic root in the Semitic languages? Well, I'll, I'll tell you one. Each letter is a, is a being in the ancient, ancient, ancient tradition. Each letter is a sound that the Holy One, and I'm using Hebrew terms here, articulates as he, she, it speaks the universe into existence. And this is why Genesis, the first book of the Bible, says, and God said, and God spoke, and God this, and it's not just God is going blah, 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 blah on the internet. God is, when these different Hebrew words for speaking and declaring and all these, these are, these are creation words. One of the words for speak is identifiably very similar, the same family as um, as Bari, the, the beautiful name Arbari. Another one is very similar to Al Khalik. Same family, Ikara Al Khalik. So you have all these, these are create, this is Allah, this is Allah Elohim in this case, is the actor in Genesis, speaking, radiating the universe into existence, breathing the universe into existence. Incredible. If you, know, if you read the Hebrew of Genesis, your mind is blown. My mind was blown. I was too young when I first retranslated it, and they say you shouldn't read, tackle Genesis before you're 40. I did, and I didn't get it. I did it when I was 50 again. It was much deeper. Because <laughs> Anyway, never mind. It just shows you can be silly and try crazy things. So... Um, Avun. Um, Jesus uses this avun probably for a cultural, or you could almost say a political, or a um, countercultural reason at the time. Almost all of Jesus' listeners were very, very, very poor people. They were not householders. Uh, they were. They had been driven off of their land. They didn't have land. Uh, they were itinerant. They were the homeless of their time, essentially. They really had nowhere else to go. And so <clears throat> they had been taught, and this was the, these were the social facts at the time, mm -hmm. that if you wanted to survive, you had to connect yourself to some powerful person who was your, I guess, in, in our current Ling language, we'd call them the patron, you know, like the godfather who's going to protect you and you serve the godfather. It's like a mafia, basically. You know, so these ancient sort of patronage systems in these cultures, the poor, you know, you had to find some rich person to attach themselves to as a servant, and then they would provide for you, maybe, hopefully, but at least would protect you from other rich people who would come and take your children or do whatever. And that's, this was the sort of very very desperate situation of Jesus and his, his listeners. They, the poor people had been taught that they had to call their patron Father. Oh, Father. Please give me, oh, Father, oh, Father, oh, Father, oh, Father. Um, I know some Christian theologians, and some Lutheran ones too, say that Jesus gave this Father thing because he wanted people to feel close to their Father, like it's like a, like a loving parent. Sorry. The, 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 the word father was poisoned 
really at this time in this outer use of it. Perhaps in the family it was helpful, um, but it was so poisoned. You know, it's like Americans calling their missiles peacemakers, or this sort of, you know, it starts to poison the word for peace linguistically. So Jesus says, call no one father. You should remember this from the New Testament. Call no one father except Avun, this one father of us all. Don't call anyone father at all. People, did, you know, the, the powerful, the, the elites did not like that at the time. This, th th this is one of the things that got him into trouble, along with eating with people he wasn't supposed to eat with, telling people they were just as good as the elites, um, mixing male and female together, and, you know, generally causing trouble. You know, this, this got him in a lot of trouble. He begins, uh, So, not just father, but fathering, mothering, parenting. You could say that there's a process in this word, which is not a being up here, sitting at some throne somewhere, but it is a process, awun. You are being parented every moment. Again, emulating the words of Genesis, which indicate very clearly that, that creation is always going on. We are always being created. We're always being breathed into. The seven days of creation are happening every moment. You know, this is clear. Uh, one of the modern Hebrew rabbis uh, says, okay, best way to understand God in the, in the mystical Jewish tradition is that God is a verb. God is a verb. God is an activity, not a being. If you, if you go in that direction, you'll be much closer. This idea that God is a being sitting somewhere, sorry, that's Plato. <laughs> okay, nothing to say against Plato. Plato is wonderful on his own terms, and I'm sure Socrates was also a nice guy if you got to know him. Uh, he was pro no, really, I'm sure he was. And he was also, you know, he's also kicked against the traces, and got, that got him into trouble. Plato had this idea that you have to categorize things very neatly. This is the God realm. This is the human realm. This is the transcendent. This is the imminent, you know, this is the perfect, you know, this is, a, you know, and they're all, this is all here, and this is the big dividing line. There's no, you know, there's no communication, there's not really communication, you know, you, you've got this, and everything gets categorized, past, present, future, inside, outside, all these things. So ancient Semitic languages don't have any of this. Mushy boundaries everywhere you look. Past, present, future, all mixed together. Inside, outside, all mixed together. So whenever, for instance, Jesus says, uh, the kingdom of heaven is within you. You remember this one? Another place he says, the kingdom of heaven is among you. In both cases, he said the same thing in Aramaic. Within and among are the same preposition in Aramaic. He could not have said otherwise. It's linguistically impossible. They have very few prepositions. So whatever is within us is also among us. There's no separation. So again, it's, it's continually saying, yes, there are paradoxes, but no separation. Again, same as in our tradition, same as, in, as Sheikh Fadlala was saying. We're, we're, in, we're in the realm of dualities. There's always either or. But it doesn't mean there's separation, necessarily. It's just the way we look at things. So Jesus' words are then full of this. Yes, there's either an or. But that doesn't mean there's separation. Ancient Hebrew tradition is the same. Now, I'm not talking about later Judaism. There's different developments of Judaism, but this is after the time of Jesus. As, as one uh, of my biblical scholar friends once said, at the time of Jesus, there are no Christians or Jews. And he even made the case there are no Christians and Jews in the Bible. Because there are no Jews at the time of Jesus. There are Hebrew-speaking people, there are he and they, there are different people have different ideas about who's the claimant to the tradition of Abraham and the prophets. They have all, they have all sorts of conflicting ideas. But we call, what we call today Judaism, rabbinical Judaism, happens only, starts to happen about 100 years after the time of Jesus, at the earliest. 
due to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem by the Romans, which Jesus had warned about. Um, and so that then begins another evolutionary process. So if we were to begin the first stage, you could use Yarab because it's, uh, it's about being created, it's about nurturance, it's about sustaining, it's about an ongoing process. And then in the next part of the prayer, Jesus uses the word I mentioned earlier, nitqa de shemoch, holy, spacious, be your shem, be your light, be your vibration. Let thy vibration in us be kept special with space around it. As I say, symbolically like a dot with a circle around it. You could say the circle is porous, but there's spaciousness around this central point. So I sometimes say to my Christian audiences, you know, like we used to have torches, flashlights, some of us still do. How do they make a flashlight? Well, they put a bulb in the middle of a reflecting magnet, which is concave, a reflecting uh, mirror, bulb, mirror. It focuses the light, exactly like Ayatollah Nur talks about. Within the niche, within the accommodation, you could say, there is a light, and this allows the light to, to shine, to be focused in a particular direction. Us, you know, each of us then being a ray in some ways. Nitka the shemok, let that be special, let that be spacious around that shem, around that light. Now, I'll pause for just a moment. So it would be Yarab, if you want to use Arabic, Yakudus would be the second. Um, Jesus was also about wordless prayer because several times people asked him, Master, how should we pray? And in one case, he said, okay, you want words? Say these words. In another case, he simply said, pray Beshemeh. Beshemeh was later translated as pray in my name, which is not absolutely wrong, it's just limited, and mostly what we find in the Bible as it's translated into European languages is a limiting translation rather than an absolutely wrong translation like the one I gave you earlier. Beshame can mean pray in my name or with my name. It could mean pray within my name. It could mean pray within my atmosphere. It could mean pray within, with my feeling, with my intention with my Shem, because Shem is not just a name that we put as a label on a name tag. Shem was like the, the light of that person, the, the vibration of that person, which connects to Shemaya. So you can say, when you pray, remember how it was when, when I was with you. Or if I'm not there, imagine I'm there, you know, and pray with that feeling as though I were praying within you, Beshemeh, with this feeling, with this atmosphere, with this Shem. And again, it's not wrong to pray in my name because, again, whenever you mention the name of a prophet, in the ancient Hebrew uh, Aramaic tradition, the prophet can become present. I mean, to mention is to bring a person hadrat, to bring them present. But to limit it to that is to keep that, you could say, to keep that being somewhere else where one does not have access to that, that feeling. Next in his prayer, he says, so we have a wound of Bashmayan, it caught a shemok, tete malkutach. Okay, we may mention that too. Ya malik. Malkutach, malik. Let your malik come. Tete does mean come, let it come, as in the translation, thy kingdom come. But tete is an intensive form in Aramaic, and it means, I'm desperate. Let this thing really happen. You know, let your, let your malkuta, let your I can, let your vision, let your empowerment come through me. You know, uh, passion, desperation is there in tete. And as a parenthetical, malkuta is feminine, not masculine in Aramaic. Um, when they translated it into Greek, they use the Greek word basileia, which is the 
also how you get the word basilica, but basileia is also, unusually enough, feminine gendered. So you have to wonder why they translated it, let thy kingdom come. Um, I'll leave that up to your imagination. Um, but in any case, you could, beyond kings and queens, I, I, I try to get beyond these feudal translations. And you see, let your I can come through us. When I say I can or I am able, let your I can come through us. You know, softening the sense of self, eliminating the sense of self. Avundabashmaya, nitkad shamo, create space. Tete malkutach, let that come through. And then what happens? Ah, incredible. You know, if you let that happen, if you let the I can come through, Jesus says, this is the most powerful line for Christians. It should remain the most powerful line if they could just, and many of them do, they get it even when they don't get it. Nechwe sibiyan haikana diba shamaya af ba'ar ah. Nechwe sibiyan haikana. They translated it as, I don't know how it is in uh, Swedish. In English, it's let thy will be done. It, so it's similar. Yeah, it's, it's using a, the Germanic form, which is what English uses. Uh, Willen, Wille, you know, this let thy will be done on earth, in earth, as it is in heaven. Okay. In Aramaic, the word that is used, uh, which I mentioned the other day as well, it's close, most closely related to um, subhan. Subhan. Sabayanach. Uh, again, the root is in the middle of the word. It's saba. Saba. With the s, the s being out here. Sab. Again, a cousin of the word is sabar because you have a containment of something, a sa, around an ub, something growing, sa ub. But in this case, saba means that you could say, the example I gave the other day is, is still the easiest to, to get. When Jesus is asked throughout the Gospels to heal someone, he responds, saba ana. In the, Bi in the normal translations of the Bible, they translate this as, I will, which sort of sounds like, okay, yeah, I'll do it, you know, if I have to. Uh, but it has nothing to do with that. It's the ba'ana means I am in contact with, this, with the supan. You could say with the, with the place where there is no separation, where we're, we were all at the heart of the one at the beginning of things. I'm in contact with this place, so of course, things will happen. Now, that's a, uh, that's the, to, to squeeze that down to say, I will, as a simple affirmation, is almost a crime, you could say. But they, that, they did the best they could do, because again, they took it from Greek mostly. Nechwe, he says, Nechwe sebeyan achaikana, let your, I translated it once as heart's desire. Let your heart's desire your meaning Allah, the source. Let your let your heart, which which contains my heart at the beginning and before time, be done here. And where is it being done? Samwati alad shemaya ara. This is what brings these two together, what brings the worlds together, what creates the connection that allows us to feel this connection between, oh, what are we going to do now? <laughs> you know, it's like, oh my gosh, life, you know. <laughs> Sheikh Fadullah was talking about it. And, and that place, which is, you could say, beyond time, beyond space, um, before time, all times, uh, all places, uh, it creates that connection. And then things happen when that comes through us. So, really speaking, the first part of Jesus' prayer, Avun de Bashmaya, it begins with Avun, the breath of Allah, the breath of Allah. Nitka de Shemok, space is created. Tete Malchutach, the fire, you could say, comes into the space. Malchutach, consciousness arises. I can. 
and then fully into form, Nechwe Sibiana Kaikana. So as it was in the beginning, you could say, or as it was before the beginning, now we see things as it is, mashallah. You know, this is so, so it is, that's how, okay, now we see things because Allah has willed it to be so. It's, it's demonstrably so. And as I tell my Christian friends, this emulates exactly the progress that Genesis, the book of Genesis, describes. First you have Elohim. If you remember in the first... This is speaking to those who were raised Christian. <laughs> so Muslims, you're, you're home free here. You don't worry. I'm, <laughs> but in the book of Genesis it says, first God, so to speak, Elohim, creates the heaven and the earth. But this is like the overture to a musical. It's not like, this is like saying, now this is the story of how these two realms came into existence through Elohim, through the one being which was, is, and will be being, being. And it says, Bereshit bara Elohim et Hashemayim wet ha'aretz. Bara, like bari, Elohim, like Allaha. So we have from Elohim to Eloha, to Allaha, to Allah. It's really the same letters, but pronounced differently slightly differently over all these thousands of years. It's all made of the same particles. And then what happens next? If you remember Christians, it says, and there was darkness on the face of the deep. And the spirit of Elohim breathed into this darkness. It says, Ruach Elohim breathed into Hoshech. Hoshech has the same roots, wait for it, as nichse, as the niche that's in the Ayatol Nur. Same Semitic family, so you need a darkness into which light can shine. Visible light, you could say. So there has to be darkness, because what's darkness in, in the Semitic tradition? It's not bad, it's not evil. That's again Plato. <clears throat> That's how that comes into Christianity. Darkness is bad. Oh, beware of the darkness, you know. Oh, no. In Semitic languages, darkness is very practical. It just simply means what you don't see. Can't see. Don't know. Sorry. It's opaque. It's, it's dark. We don't see. It's very practical. And then there's light. So the spirit, you could say, Ruach Elohim, the breath, Ruach, Ruach, right? Elohim, Ruach of Allah, breathes into Hoshech, the unknown, swirls around a little bit. In Marahefet, it describes this sort of going like this. Al ha-ma'im, and it's flowing. There's water, ma'im. It's like a big ocean, darkness, breath, boom. Well, there's no boom. It just says, and then there was light. And our or is the same root as nur, but nur has an n on it. And from the Hebrew you have aor, light, Aramaic, nur. The Hebrew word, uh, the Aramaic word for light has an h uh, in, before the r. Arabic removes the h and you just have nur. Aor, nur, nur, an nur. Again, the same, the light. And so after the breath breathes into the darkness, the unknowing, then, then we know something more. Then more is known. The universe has come into existence as an experiment in knowing and discovering. This is what the ancient Hebrew storytellers wanted to tell us. Uh, it got covered over with all this stuff about, oh, well, how long was a day in you know, Genesis? And, you know, was it a thousand years? And, you know, was, the, was it created in literally seven days or not? And, you know, and then you get into all these theories they had. Well, so the earth can only be so old, and so evolution is an impossibility because <laughs> it's incredible. It's, it's, it's wonderful, actually, how inventive the human consciousness is. But the prayer of Jesus goes through this stage. From the beginningness, avun, spaciousness, breath comes into spaciousness, then malkuta, I canness, consciousness, and then the earth and its beings begin to be formed, which mean diversity, more diversity, more diversity. Amazing, incredible. 
let's take some time to do this practice. Ya Rab, Ya Kudus, Ya Malik. And we'll do the form uh, Ya Subhan, which is mostly done in Qadari tradition rather than Subhanallah. Um, I don't know, maybe, it's, maybe you're doing it here also, but Ya, ya Subhan. Um, and when we do Ya Subhan, let's hold not only that space of glory of Allah, but imagine that we are all together within the heart of Allah before, you know, on the day of Allah's two, let's say. That's good enough. We won't, we won't think before the day of Allah's two, but there may, it would have been the day before, <laughs> which is perhaps described in Genesis. We're all together there before our family history, before all this history happened, pre, prehistory. We're there, and that this, this possibility that was there exists now to bring into our lives, to transform our lives. The possibility of no, no impressions, no pollution, no family history, no neuroticism, uh, no, need for psycho- no need for psychology because it, we're all back at the beginning before we had, you know, they did whom to what and this and that and the other thing. So let's do a bit of that. We'll start, I think, I think we're best to use Yarab. Ya Rab, 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 Ya Ya Kudus, 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 Ya Kudus. Ya Kudus. Tete Malkutach, Tete Malkutach. Ya Malik, 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 Nehwe Sibiana Haikana de Bashmaya of Bara Ah Ya Supan, 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 
Ya Subhan, 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 Ya Subhan. Nechwe Sibyan, I call him the Bashmai of Ba'ah. Let your heart's desire be done in us, through us, as in all light, so in all forms, as in all particles, so in all waves, in all of our connectedness, in all of our separation. The rest of the prayer is about how, um, well, it's all practical, but the rest of the prayer is more about how we live with each other um, until we come to the end. Now, notice that in Surah Fatiha also starts, Alhamdulillahi Rabbi Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim So Rab, Maliki Yomadin, that comes in quite early. So the surrendering, the bowing, going down. Ehtina surat al mustaqim. So hadi, sense of guidance, comes in. Similar things happen in Jesus' prayer at this point. Uh, a little different because they're coming out of it different needs, different groups, you know, different things are needed. Um, Again, at Jesus' time, on a practical level, most of his people, the people who were sitting around listening to him, who had nowhere else to go, food was an issue. And they had been told that they shouldn't eat with each other because this person's unclean, that person's unclean. He's, you know, he's a, he's a man, that's and so on. So the, who you were supposed to be eating with was a big issue at this time because the priests had told them, the priests in Jerusalem had told them, no, you've got this and this, and I don't eat that, and da, da, da. Jesus operated mostly outside of this area in Galilee, so he was bringing people together who, according to the tradition of the Jerusalem temple, should not have been eating and drinking together, but most of these people were just happy to be eating and drinking at all, frankly. So, to include in the prayer a line about bread was very important as it's usually translated, give us this day our daily bread. There is, of course, more to the Aramaic than that, as there always is. Now, Arabic does have the word that is identifiably like lachama, but mostly it's translated as meat. However, I would argue that the dictionaries are wrong on this point, uh, and that <clears throat> the meat is in the old Semitic sense, meat meaning any food that gives you sustenance. So it doesn't necessarily mean an animal product, as has been pointed out by several scholars of Hebrew as well. So perhaps it came to mean that, and so meat becomes a staple of the diet, but you know, I'm not here to talk about cultural history. So lachama is bread. Yes, it is something to do with with a product of, a type of product of wheat, grown wheat, but it's more than this. Lachma also can be translated as understanding, practical understanding of how to find food. It's like a little bit of the, of the, of the flavor of uh, arazak is in lachma. That is, how do we discover what our nurturance actually is? How do we create food, how do we share food? Do you have food? Do you want to share it with another? You know, who, you know, 
but not only about just feeding the body, but it can mean food on any level of life. Practical understanding. Do I need food for my relationships? Do I need food for understanding my neighbor? Do I need food for knowing how to, to do X, Y, or Z? So it's really about what we call practical, even you could say do-it-yourself know-how uh, in, in any realm of everyday life. It's related to the word that means wisdom in Hebrew and in Aramaic, uh, which is the one what I would suggest if you're doing a wazifa for it. Uh, in Hebrew, the word for wisdom is chokhma, chokhma, chokhma. As it comes into the time of Jesus, it's tra it becomes goes from chokhma to hakima, both feminine gendered, by the way. But you see, the ancient Semitic peoples, they weren't that fussed about gender things as we are. So Arabic is all full of this gender balancing, you know, that and sifa, you know, all this. But it wasn't about gender politics. It was just about balance. It's just about, you know, okay, we've got, once you've got gender, you've got one, and then you've got a content, you know, one and then the other, one and the other. So the, the languages were all full of these, these gendered, feminine, masculine, or non-gendered terms in the Semitic alphabet. Because they noticed, they looked around, okay, well, that seems to be feminine, that seems, seems to be a female plant, seems to be a male plant, you know, well, I don't know what that is, so we'll call it neuter. You know, it's sort of in some way in between the two. It's sort of between the genders, or, or maybe no gender, or, you know. So, look, you know, I tell my Christian audiences, why are you getting upset? Genesis 1, Genesis 1 26 says, let us create the human being in our image. Elohim is a word that means unity, you could say sacred unity, oneness, oneness which has many faces. So it's a, it's a singular meaning, but a plural ending. You can't wrap your head around that. <laughs> There's a singular and a plural in the same word. We can't do that, you know, it's, like, it's just like, well, what's that about? Let us create the human in our image, the human, one human, in our image, male and female. That's literally what the Hebrew of Genesis says. And it even says that in most translations. But people just sort of read through it, oh, well, and that means Adam and Eve. No, it says the human, one human. One human being was created in our image, male and female. That means within the human, there is all this, there's, we have all of it within us. The male, the female, the, the between the male and the female, uh, the non-male, you know, because you know, again, it's created in a unity. Uh, and some traditions of Jewish mysticism even say this, that the first human being was, a, you know, one human, male, female, some combination of both. We don't know how it was, but it's story. You know, it's, we're, we're talking creation type story. But there's some wisdom in that of understanding differences. So, Chochma, holy wisdom. The whole book of Proverbs is dedicated to her. Wisdom speaks. Again, in Christian Bibles, oftentimes, instead of capitalizing the word for wisdom, and making it clear that it's feminine gendered, they make it lowercase and think, oh, well, it's just a concept. You know, it's just wisdom. Wisdom, you know, well, what is... No, it's because, you know, the, at some point, the Christian tradition became very afraid of the feminine. And so they only capitalized the words he. <laughs> and all the she's they lowercased <laughs> when you have the God referred to as in terms of feminine. Really, it's beyond both of those. I don't know why, you know, it's, it's, you could blame history, you know, it's just, but again, re remember when you read the Bible, if you ever choose to read the Bible, lowercase all words. Semitic languages have no capital letters, not for God either, you know. You're supposed to know who God is, you're not supposed to know what reality is. Why do you need to capitalize the letters? Come on, you know, it's a no-brainer. You know, what, what is reality? Do we need to capitalize a letter? That's only if you said it outside of yourself. It's a linguistic swindle, frankly. Lowercase all letters.
or capitalize them all, I don't care. <laughs> so Jesus says, let us, give us, Yeshua says, please, Allah, Habla Lachma, give us this understanding. Give us bread for all the needs of our lives. Give us sustenance. Give us nurturance. Give us what we need for our friends, to understand our friends, our family, our relationships, um, our world. Give us the practical understanding of what we should be doing at this moment to get by. And the words for to get by are Dasun Kanan Ya Omana. Just enough, Dasun Kanan, Ya Omana, which is like Yom, Yom, Hebrew, Yom, Yomana, Aramaic, Yom, as in Yom Adin, Arabic. For this Yom, for this illuminated moment, for this instant of time, for this moment that light has illuminated, which is really what a day is in the Semitic languages. It's a combination of Iyaor, ancient Hebrew, or Aor, ancient Hebrew, with a, in a particle, like a particle of light, which is sort of like what scientists talk about, like a quanta of light. For this quanta of light, for this instant, for this illuminated moment, give us the understanding of how to get by and, and just, you know, manage. You know, the practical wisdom for this moment. And bread is part of that, too. There's no question. So this is what I mean. It's, it is bread, and it's bigger than bread. What's the other thing? And, you know, so he's talking about, in a group like this, he says, okay, so, you know, who's got bread, you know? And uh, have you got enough bread? And, uh, oh, yeah, I got to, oh, my God, how long have I been talking? Okay, I'll, I'll wind it up here soon. <laughs> We're almost done anyway. You know, so then all these stories of the feeding of all these thousands of people. You know, well, how did this happen? Well, you know, maybe people started to share. Maybe he did create bread. Why not? It's also possible. You know, well, how do you create bread? You know, you create generosity. It's possible. I'm not saying Jesus didn't do miracles. Miracles. But in these days, a miracle was not what it's considered now because they didn't have an idea of what's contrary to science. It was just like something unexpected happened. Okay, this person was lame and now he's walking. You know, this person couldn't see, now she's seeing. Oh, well, there wasn't bread and now there's a bread and oh, there's a fish. Mm. <laughs> wow, I haven't seen a fish for a while. <laughs> Fantastic. But, you know, he got into trouble with that. Uh, anyway, I'll go into it. Because, you know, he does this, he has this feeding event and then he goes out in a boat to escape from the crowds. Because they're all, and then he comes back to the shore the next morning after being with his close people, and they say, do it again, Master, do it again, do it again. You know, just like we would today. You know, read the Gospel of John. It's, it's tremendously funny. And then he gets up and he says to them, oh, yeah, you know, look, you won't understand me unless you, unless you learn how to eat my body and drink my blood. And, they all, and the disciples say to him, Master, you know, they're not getting this. You know, this is really pretty obscure what you're saying. In Aramaic, what he's saying is, you know, you need to understand my blood, which is my essence, where I'm coming from. Blood means essence in Aramaic, dami, you know, like Adam, like the nature of the human being. And you need to, you know, eat, eat, eat my body. The, Aramaic does not have a word for living body, only for dead body. So he says, you have to eat my corpse. And that means, you know, yeah, no, literally, that's what he's saying. That's why they're also put off and the crowds filter away. And the disciples say, oh, well, we missed that moment, you know. It's like, you know, this could have been a big thing, but it's like, and Jesus says, oh, yeah, well, I'm glad they're gone. You know, it's like, it says, eat my corpse. And that means you're like, you're missing the point here. You're taking the husk, take the essence. You know, chew on the husk and let it go through you. What's a corpse? A corpse is just a, it's a thing, you know. It's, no, this, is a, this word comes back later in the Last Supper, and it's, that's also misinterpreted, but nonetheless. The other thing, the only other thing he gives people is what? Forgive, let go, forgive, let go, yagafur, al-gafar, istafar Allah, istafar Allah. They, they use a slight, there's a different word in the Aramaic for this, but you can use gafur, gafar, I would say use hakim, 
or hakam for practical wisdom. Gafar, gafur, letting go, tawab is good too. In the same, uh, the Asma Husna is beautiful in all these forgiveness, letting go words. Incredible. Very rich. Much more refined than the Aramaic. Aramaic has just this simple word for release. Untie. Shwuklan. Listen to the line carefully. Washbuklan chobain wachtahain. I kanada chanan shwachanachayabain. It's a lot of. <laughs> this is not an accident. This is not a curiosity. You know, I say to people, listen to those sounds. It's like you've got a cold and you're trying to get this, get rid of this. No, literally, yeah. You know, because the body does this. And in Hebrew Aramaic, this is the life energy. And then as it comes into form, there are four, this is where Hebrew and Aramaic are rich, of words for life. There's letters for life. There's the sound, there's the sound, okay, the life energy is coming a bit into form now. There's the sound, and then there's the sound, wait for it. <laughs> Arabic does get that because we get it in this Ain Rain is a remnant of this ancient Semitic. The breath has become too trapped in form because it's meant to breathe, we're meant to be breathing back and forth between form and no form. And when we get trapped in this form, this it becomes the sound. And that's see what it's just like. Oh no, you know, it's like. So we still do, you know, we still have this, right? Come on. You know, we say, oh no, you're reading the news, it's like, oh no, what's happening in my country? It's awful. I'm saying in Italian, she says, you don't live there anymore, don't worry about it. Like, oh, no, but it hurts my heart. I haven't lived there for 20 years, but it hurts my heart, you know, it's like, oh. It's te- you know, and it's just release, release, let go. It's history. You know, it's like, okay. It happens to everyone. Okay, you know. So, wash buklan in this release. Let the breath release from these holdings on. Yes, you could have done better before. So what? Do better next time. You know, shpuklan, release, 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 release. The beautiful thing about the Hebrew, about the Aramaic, is that this word for release also means you are released. Again, the, there's the doer and the and the done is is compressed into one, and this is why he says, as we release, at the same moment we are released. Not be, not you do this, you get that. Not you release first, then you get released. You forgive, then you will be. No, no if then. There's no if then. There's no first this, then that. It's all the same time. As you release, you are released. And you are released into this bigger universe of Allah, of the uni- of unity, of Allah. You are released. And this is why on the cross, Jesus uses the same word, which is again misunderstood. He's not saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Sorry. I know you were told that. Sorry. And there's a lot of nice theology around that. And some of it's beautiful. So if you get value from it, alhamdulillah. But what he's really saying is, Ail, Ail, O Allah, you've released, I'm released, you've released me for this. I'm released back into your arm. I'm released back to you. This was, and implied there's, this was my purpose. I was released for this, you could say. I am being released. I will be, be released. This was my purpose to do, and so I'm released. I, I fulfilled my purpose, I'm released. Alhamdulillah. Now, whether he actually died on the cross or not, I'm not going into because we don't have time for that. I have studied all the traditions around this, including the Quran, of what the Quran says. <laughs> no, no, you don't want to know. <laughs> no, no, I have to. We have to finish the prayer. The prayer is more important. There's, there's one more line. Because again, like at the end of Surah Fatiha, remember it says, 
So it says, show us this path of wonder, enjoyment, where it's all easy. You know, it has to be a path of wonder and joy, right? Because actually, echtinas, yahadi, originally in the Aramaic, had in Aramaic means to follow guidance with joy. There's joy in it. There's always joy in it. Jesus says at the end of Matthew's uh, Beatitudes, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. He uses a form of the word hadi. Follow guidance, because if you're following guidance, be joyful. Be joyful you found it and you're following it. Alhamdulillah. Anyway, at the end of the Aramaic prayer, it has something like, and it goes like this. Beautiful, beautiful lines. Um, Wela tachalan linisuna. Wela tachalan linisuna. Do not let us enter into. Notice the grammar. Do not let us enter into. I use the Arabic here. Nisa. Aramaic, nisayuna. Do not let us enter forgetfulness. Okay, forgetfulness is going to happen. Because in Semitic prayers, you always mention opposites. If you have remembrance, as I said the other day, there has to be forgetfulness. So always everything is brought in. Yes, there's a forgetful part of me. Okay, we include that too. We don't want to forget. He could have said, help us always remember. But that would have been like, oh, forgetful part of me that is still in process. You don't exist. But in fact, it does exist. So, at the same time, set us free. Patsan means, it's a little bit like it's, it's a cousin of fata. To oh, pats, patsan, because pat, pa becomes fa in, a little bit later. Ila patsan min bisha, set us free from unripeness. Not being ripe, not acting at the right time, at the right place. So, bisha, bisra, okay? Bisra, bisra, evil in Aramaic means unripeness. Bisha, same in Hebrew. So their definition of what was evil was that which was, was not ripe. That is, it could be overripe, it could be rotten, it could be ready for compost. And acti some activity in our culture may be ready for composting. It was ripe at one point, it passed its sell-by date, and now... Compost, compost, because there's no place to throw anything out, right? Because there's no out to throw it. Or it could be still greening, it's still be unripe, it's not yet ripened. Wait a little bit. Set us free from this unripeness, not acting at the right time, at the right place. In the moment again, in the wacht, in the moment. Let, help us be in the moment. Not forgetful, but help us be in the moment. Because again... Um, St. Paul, who a lot of people don't like, um, but is not as bad as you've heard, <laughs> if you read him in Aramaic. But <laughs> St. Paul said, um, you know, if, some, if I'm in a deep state of rapture or prayer and someone needs a piece of bread, I'll get out of the rapture and give them the piece of bread. That's that's acting rightly. Because you could just stay in prayer all the time. We could. Uh, it's lovely. Go on Kilvat. I love Kilvat. I tell you. <laughs> I could be <laughs> really. Um, but it's, you know, it's not ripe. There's a world. You know, we've got things to do, each of us. So help us to be ripe and to do what needs to be done and be in the moment and, and remember at the same time and not be forgetful. So between forgetfulness and unripeness, help us steer this course. Neither forgetful nor unripe. Now, as you know, it was translated, lead us not into temptation. That's caused innumerable school children, raised Christian, problems, myself included. We all argued about it. How can God lead you into temptation? Sorry, doesn't make sense. And then they tell you about Pharaoh and God hardened Pharaoh's heart 
and all of this, and da-da-da. Okay, there's some Quranic tradition around this too. Pharaoh was given a lot of opportunity. Musa came, you know, Prophet Musa came again and again. And then Pharaoh, he, he was like on the edge. You know, he knew everything that he needed to know. And just out of his foolishness, out of his foolish perversity, as Rumi says in the Mathnawi, he, he refused. But maybe that was his, his, his mission, was to be the foolish, perverse denier. Um, then we're going into a halage with this theology, but we won't go there. So, <laughs> no. So, for most, for most of us, it's about just not being forgetful, not being unripe, alhamdulillah. And then at the end of the prayer, you have, you could say you have a summation line, which was typical of Semitic prayers. Sometimes they say this was added later. I don't find evidence for this. This was some myth that was added later. So at the end of the prayer, it's, it brings it back to the beginning. And many, as I say, Semitic prayers are like this. Metul de la kuta. It's in Matthew's version, but not in Luke's. But, you know, maybe Jesus pray, prayed the prayer differently at different times. Come on, you know. He wasn't going to church. You know, there were no churches. There were no synagogues actually. Different prayers for different people. You know, it may be one time he added, to you belongs all the Malik. To you, Allah, to you, Rab, belongs all the Malik, all the activity, all the vision, all the power. To you belongs all the life energy. To you belongs all the Malik, all the Hay. And then he has a word that we don't have exactly in Arabic, to you belongs the song, the music, the harmony. And this, this type of trinity, which was for Jesus the trinity, the, the vision, the power, and the, the vision, the power, and the song continues. It says, Alam Almin, Alam Almin. So this comes to the word that we have in Arabic, Rabbi al in he- Hebrew Aramaic, they have la alam or la olam, very similar. And the formula that's used in many of the prayers is la alam almin, or from 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 alam to alam, from gathering to gathering, from age to age, from time to time, from this moment to the next moment. This is renewing itself, renewing itself, renewing itself. And then, the final word, of course, same one we use, a little differently pronounced. Amen. 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 Christians say amen. They don't know what they're saying. Some, maybe, maybe they believe they're saying trust. You know, okay, this is where. So mostly they think they're saying the end. I find. Because they're not actually not really sure what they're saying. It's just that they're supposed to say it. So, amen. Imanuta, where we started. Same root. When you would seal an agreement in Jesus' culture and in the culture before him. They didn't have written contracts. It was a verbal culture. So you would say, Amen. I will be true to what I've just said. I will do this and this. Amen. This is, this is my, this is as true, I, I, on the, on, as I, this is as true as I can be standing in unity as this individual person can be. So Jesus says again and again in the Gospels, Amen, Amen, Amar Anallah. Truly, truly, I say unto you. Same word that's used at the end of the prayer. It's just in this case, he uses it first. Really, this is, this is as real as I can be with you in this moment. Listen up. Amen. Lulam Amin, Amen. So, Lulam Amin, Amen. Thank you all. Alhamdulillah, let's say Surah Fatiha. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Arahmanir Rahim. Maliki Yomedin. Iyakana Budua Iyakana Stain. Ehdina Siratal Mustakim. Siratal Ladina Anamta Alehim. Rail Maglubi Alehim. Uladalin. Amin. Thank you all for your patience, for your patience, for your patience. Alhamdulillah.
Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah.